you know that's why we put jack in the box at the end it's a, a daft song about me wanting to kill a fox in the garden that keeps shitting on my car <laughs> it's kind of like it's kind of like our octopus's garden you know My name's Jen and I'm joined by Kelly Jones from Stereophonics for the latest in Enemies in Conversation series. So thank you very much for your time today. Uh, I know that you've been speaking to lots of people in Japan this morning, but how have things been in in general? Yeah, good. Yeah, we've been back in rehearsals doing some uh, uh, radio sessions and stuff like that. So it's good to get back and playing. You know, it's been almost two years since we've been on tour properly. So. Yeah, it's been, a, it's been a good crack hanging out with the boys again and, and doing some stuff. Does it take a while to get back into the swing of it or is it like you've never been away really? Well, we didn't do much the first year of the pandemic and then we got together. Like on the second year, we all started to get, you know, when everybody was allowed to mix and all that kind of stuff again. So, so then we were kind of doing a, like a rehearsal once a week and all that kind of stuff. So it takes a little bit, but, you know, after you get in there a few weeks, it's all right. Yeah, it's been all right. We're just doing loads of cover versions, having a laugh for a few weeks, just knocking about, you know get the boys and the crew back there they've all been sitting around doing nothing for a long time so it was good and so you've got album number 12 coming out and it originally started when you met up to do like a 25th anniversary compilation weren't you so how did that end up then becoming the new record uh well <clears throat> well like i said really i mean the first the first year we didn't really do anything to do in music um and then I kind of realised that it was about 25 years since the first album. And I thought we haven't had a greater hit since Decade in the Sun, which was about 2008, 2009. And there's been a lot of big songs since that time, really. And a lot of young kids, 16, 17, 18, you know, who come to the gigs. And, you know, there's a lot of big songs that were not on that compilation. So I thought maybe it was uh, a time to, to compile the second half, if you will, you know, um, onto one record. And I thought when we do that, normally you try to put two or three new songs on it. So I came in the studio, I had to look through some old hard drives about some <clears throat> what was there, really. Um, and I found a bunch of stuff which I really liked, which we haven't used before. Um, but it's different for me. I mean, I never think of songs as being old or new because when they release, then they become new. Um, <laughs> for example, Hanging on Your Hinges was actually recorded on the Kind session on the last album, but it just didn't fit on that record. Sailor V was recorded on the graffiti and the train session. It didn't fit on that record. So on this record, I found tracks like um, Forever and When You See It and a few other tracks, half and half finished. And I wanted to kind of complete them. And of course, typically in doing so, whenever a musician gets in the studio, he starts messing about and writing new songs. And then I got the boys in the studio. And then before we knew we had 14 or 15 new songs. So we said, well, you know, fuck the compilation record. Let's just put a new record out. So <laughs> we went from one thing to the other thing quite quickly, really. So... Uh, maybe the compilation idea was just a catalyst to get back in a room together and, and make some stuff, you know. Going through those hard drives and things, sometimes having time away from a song allows you yeah. to listen to it with fresh ears, doesn't it? And you go, oh, actually, that can be a springboard for the rest of it. Absolutely, yeah. And I mean, it's interesting how, you know, for me going back listening to music, I don't keep a diary, but my lyrics and my albums are kind of a bit like what you were doing at that point in your life, you know. Um so there are some songs where you, I, I wrote uh, whatever I was going through that time, but they can transcend and be related to what you're going through now as well. So there's a connection with Forever, there's a connection to You Do Feel My Love and stuff like that when it was written and what it is like now as well. And it's a bit like how the audience interprets songs. They all have their own interpretation of it. So I wouldn't put it out if it didn't mean anything to me. Mm -hmm. um, but the songs kind of uh, feel very fresh and relevant and they, and they fit in that group of songs that's on the record. I mean, it's a very intimate album, isn't it? In terms of the lyrical content, in terms of the songs, it's very emotional as well. I mean, Right Place, Right Time, that mm -hmm. sounds like a very personal song. I um, mean, there are yeah. some lyrics, it's, it's lovely to refer to the mother of your first children saying, oh, what a gift, and then talking about your soulmate with your wife. It's, yeah. It seems very raw in, in some ways. Is yeah. it scary to kind of share that much or is it the sort of thing by you're used to it by now? No, it's a strange song because um, <laughs> I think it was the day I had my first COVID jab and I was just wandering around King's Road going in and out of the Starchy Gallery trying to find some inspiration for the album artwork. And then I walked on, it was a really sunny day and then I ended up sitting on a roof terrace and I just wrote loads of verses and it was a bit like, how did I get here kind of thing. Uh, like stepping stones where when I was boxing, when I met Stuart, where they had a drum kit and then 
I've never written a song where I've mentioned three girlfriends in one song before, so it's quite it's quite it's quite strange actually. But it's it's kind of about serendipity and it's kind of about destiny and you know that kind of song could go on forever. You can you can name everybody in your whole life where you've had an encounter with uh, friends and colleagues and or whatever. But um, but the song came together quite well, really. It just had a few chords and it pieced it together and the voice put the bits to in the studio and it became this kind of dreamy kind of story song and. And it is, as you say, it's very honest and it's very kind of revealing. And um, I don't know, maybe that is a reflection of something to do with the pandemic. I don't think any song is about the pandemic, but it is a song about reflection, which is what time gives you, I suppose. And I'd say you go over everything. So that was the beginning with the band, as well as your love life and things like that. And so it is, it's like a, just a biography and song for yeah. like, how are we doing this band? And this is how we've, we've come out. And as you say, you've had such longevity and such an incredible career. It could have been like a meatloaf opus 10 minutes long if you carried <laughs> on going, couldn't it? Like, <laughs> yeah, 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 could still be there now, you know. <laughs> it's like... I've feared the song out, but I'm still in the studio if I can sing and everything that's happened to me in my life. But, um, <laughs> But yeah, yeah, it worked out all right, that one. Yeah, I quite like that. It's good. It's a good team. It was one of the favourites in the studio. That was one of the last ones we recorded before we came home. That's the sort of thing I should imagine has made a few people cry uh, when they've heard it. Yeah, I have listened to it for a while, and I don't know how many people have actually heard the record yet, but it's interesting you picked up on it, because a lot of the journalists I've been speaking to have picked up on that track. And um, I don't know if it's because of the lyric content, it's quite a story going on in there. So I, I suppose, as you say, it's quite revealing straight from the off. So but it's interesting that people have been picking out on that one. Um, I don't know if anybody's crying on it yet, but we'll find out. <laughs> well, I think that's, that must be an interesting thing for you, that obviously you've put all these songs together, you've collated them as a record, and then it's like, yeah. here, it's out in the world. And with journalists, with fans, seeing which ones people connect with most, I guess it can be quite difficult to predict sometimes. Yeah, very much so, because, you know, you make a record as a collaboration, solely as a songwriter that you know I write the songs that make me feel a particular way and then I present them to the band and and we do what we do together and then you have to bring in a team of people you know people who want to put the song on the radio and people who want to put the song on make videos or whatever so it becomes quite a short list very very quickly really and sometimes the ones that there's a lot of albums I think songs have got away and they didn't actually get selected to be those choices um because they may not have been right for airplay or, or whatever, you know, um, and then you play them live and they become these massive fan favourites live. So you do get a bit boxed in a little bit about what people will think will work on radio stations and stuff like that. Mm. Um, and it happens so quickly before you know the album's kind of over, the campaign sort of thing is over and you're playing live around the world and then you can actually see from people's reactions what really works, you know. So, yeah, it's different all the time. It's interesting, as you say, that like Hanging on Hinges was from the kind recording session so that was left over from that and now it's like yeah. the opening track on the album yeah. it's a real kind of rock and roll statement of intent isn't it so we can talk yeah. about right place right time which obviously is much slower but a lot of the songs are just straight up rock and roll aren't they yeah hanging on hinges definitely a great opener great rock and roll song you know uh when you see it it's kind of a big anthemic song as well um running around my brain has got you know hints of acdc and tom petty there's a lot of rock and roll songs and then you got stuff like uh, All I Have Is You, who's kind of got a Velvet Underground vibe. Mm -hmm. And then they got a soulful things like um, uh, Seen That Look Before and all that. So it kind of goes into lots of different things. You know, I, I like stuff like uh, Leave the Light On, which is kind of very beautiful. It's almost like a Van Morrison kind of vibe. Um, so the record's almost like a mixtape in many ways. You know, there's a lot of styles on there. The only album I can compare it to of our own albums is probably something like Performance and Cocktails, where that go from bartender and the thief to hurry up and wait to one believe your radio to just looking you know it was it's a very lots of different styles of songs but they're all very very melodic you know um so it's it, it's a good collection of tunes and um that's probably where the title lucia comes from it's just a senseless word the kind of you know kind of celebration joy wherever you know it's just like doesn't mean it's anything fun to say. yeah <laughs> doesn't, doesn't sound the same in my accent but it's fun no. to say anyway yeah, exactly yeah <laughs> I think it's with the way that people listen to music now, for example, people tend to pick and choose songs or listen to things on random. It's going to be quite interesting in the fact that they are so different and mm. it keeps people's attention perhaps because there is so much going on and people perhaps don't often sit and listen from start to finish as they used to. The way yeah. that music is consumed has changed. 
do you does that ever have much of an input in how you write and record or is it just what works for the record that's all that you think about I think some albums have a a, a particular tone from beginning to end I think kind of that it was an album that once you're in there you, you kind of go in this kind of gospel soulful Nashville kind of Americana it, it, it does that thing throughout really this album it kind of is like a compilation but it's a compilation of all new songs mm-hmm. um so I still piece albums together as albums. I still try to see them as side A and side B. Um, I I still try to do the running order like a set list in a gig, try to hit with a big one and then go through. Um, I'm, I'm never going to be the type of person that's just going to get a bunch of songs and just throw them on it because I don't care how people listen to it. If they want to go individually, I'll always try to piece it together as a piece of work uh, that kind of takes you on a bit of a journey, really. You know, that's why we put Jack in the Box at the end. It's a a daft song about me wanting to kill a fox in the garden that keeps shitting on my car. <laughs> it's kind of like, it's kind of like our octopus's garden, you know, but we had, we all played it live. George Draculius is in the room. We had, you know, Mike Campbell from Tom Petty playing the banjo on it. And Adam does a, an amazing the guitar solo on acoustic, which I still to this day think was a fucking fluke. <laughs> and if he just records it three times live and we just picked one take. And every time we put it on, all the kids would start jumping up and down. And we thought, Either we've got to find some animated movie about a fucking fox or we just stick it on the end of the record. So so it does take you on a journey and finishes off with a laugh, you know. Yeah, it's one of those things that I think you must listen to and go, where did that come from? I've no yeah. idea how this has happened. We wouldn't be able to recreate it again if we tried, but no, I'm just, glad we did. Yeah, it's, it's just a bit of a ridiculous, you know, humour at the end of the and 2022 is set to be a very busy one for you. Obviously, you've got your own big tour coming up. You've got this incredible show with Tom Jones, Catfish and the Bottle Men coming up later on this year. Yeah. Are you excited? How many preparations have been done already? Is there anything you can tell us about the, the show and stuff that you're looking forward to? Yeah, we've been doing lots of preparation on the arena tour, uh, on the stage design and all that kind of stuff and, and the song list. Uh, you know, probably both three or four of the new record and then obviously going through the catalogue. I mean, 12 albums, there's about 180 songs and a lot of big songs. You know, we've been fortunate enough throughout our run to have at least two or three big songs on every record. So as a fan base, we try to appeal to the kid that's known us for 10 minutes and to the people that's known us for 25 years, you know. Um, so it's going to be a big show. I think you're going to, you know, walk out in a better frame of mind than you did when you walked in. I think it's going to be a, a big show and good, a lot of good songs. Um and the stadium shows, you know, they were postponed from December. They were meant to be uh, something for people to look forward to, particularly in, in South Wales, because they'd been locked up for so long, really. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't happen in December. But, you know, nobody, I, didn't, I think we had under 1% people wanting a refund. If anything, we've opened up more tickets. So I think, in, I think in June it'll be, it'll be even better, you know. Um, and we're doing a bunch of other festivals in and around that as well, which we start announcing in the next few weeks. I haven't quite got into Europe and the rest of the world yet with all the complications, but we are happy to be back on the road from March through to September doing shows all over the place, yeah. You mentioned, I think, to Enemy last year that you were hoping to play Glastonbury, that you were waiting on a call. Has anything <laughs> happened there yet? Is there no anything? Call, no. <laughs> no calls from Glastonbury, no. Uh, we, had the, we had those Saturday night in the Pyramid stage and that was that. We, um, we're not going back. <laughs> Like, oh, please, <laughs> not yet. Again, yeah. <laughs> not yet. We've got some good stuff coming up, though, because we've got some good shows coming up this summer. So a few of them have been cancelled because of certain things that have happened. But, mm. but I think there's some good stuff to look forward to. And so previously, with the singles and things that you were releasing, you had opened up about things that had gone on with your son. Uh, there was a song that you released previously that you thought was uh, sexuality about coming out, but then it turned out that Colby was transitioning. Mm. Um, and you've talked about your pride um, so did that inspire any songs on the record and, and how do you feel now about how attitudes are changing I know you mentioned that you were relieved that his school friends were lovely about it so how, how has that been in terms of like response from, from fans and how do you think things are changing in society well I think the reason we spoke about it as a family to start with you know I've, I've always been pretty private with my family stuff uh, but it was such a a big episode for us as a family and we didn't really know what to do we had to do so much research and uh care into keeping our family safe in something like that and and learn a lot for ourselves you know so if that helped other people along the way within our you know small thing that we revealed then great um colby's doing great he's now in the brit school 
studying there and around lots of like-minded kids going through many different and, and similar situations, you know. Um, and everybody's trying to just get through the best we can, you know. Um, it's an ongoing story, really. You know, the kids, Kobe's going to be 18 next October, and I'm sure there'll be other episodes after that. So you, as a family, try to do as much as you can around that. Song-wise on the record, if there's anything on there, I, I don't know, maybe something like Every Dog Has His Day is talking about, I don't know if it's talking particularly about any of the kids, but I think it is talking about uh, self-esteem and self-belief. And I know a lot of teenagers feel that everybody around them is doing a lot better than they are. And, you know, that, uh, there's moments in time they feel, what's the point anyway, kind of thing. So I think that song hints at maybe some feelings that were going on around at that time. Mm -hmm. um, the chorus of that I've had for many, many years, but the verses particularly, I do think, speak around that feeling. Yeah, possibly. And in, do, do you think there's going to be another musician in the family then, if they're going to the Brit School uh, the musical or is it acting? <laughs> are they doing? Are they doing digital design? Actually, he's doing yeah. um, like game designer stuff. But my my five year old is like Liza Minnelli running around the house. If she doesn't end up on the fucking stage <laughs> boards, I don't know who will. Um, she's she doesn't stop. She's in stagecoach and all sorts of stuff. She's she's great. I mean, she loves. I think she could be Matilda in a few years or something like that. She's into it big time. But um, Kobe's a great piano player, but and then Misty has a little battle of the bands in school now and again. So they all they all touch on it, but they don't talk to me about it. They certainly don't talk to me about my music. They've got no interest at all. I mean, it's like, they, oh, boring. Yeah, they get dragged to the shows sometimes, but they used to dance to the songs and I'd give me a hint about you know what was going to work. I remember them all being really into Indian summer, and that became a big hit. But they were a bit younger then. It's not like I walk in the house and they go and they say, "Dad, the guy from the band is home." <laughs> I tend just to be moot. I don't talk about it. <laughs> and so you mentioned about uh, the amount of songs that you've had when it comes to narrowing down things on the set list. I think you said previously that you were actually having to listen to your own songs on Spotify to remember them, to remember mm -hmm. some of the lyrics from the yeah. old tracks. Yeah. Is, does it get harder with each album when you've just got more and more songs to remember? Yeah, it can be. Yeah, I can't remember the fucking chords in half. The, when you talk about right place, right time, I've been trying to work the chords out for that for three days. I, I, can't, I can remember where it is. <laughs> Um, yeah, you're doing those Jeep anniversary shows a few months back. That, that was interesting just to go through those songs again because you remember them, obviously, when you record them. And the last two albums, three albums particularly, we've recorded in such a short amount of time, seven days, nine days, some of them. Um, it's not like you've lived with the songs for a long time. You literally go in there because we've been wanting to capture performances on the last few records. And because the band's on form, and we had a great engineer and a great room. We just literally went in, play them two, three times, and that's the only time we ever play them. And mm -hmm. then you walk out, and then you maybe dick about them after tweaking this, that, and the other. But it's not like you've lived with that song for months, and I know this inside out. You literally walk out of there. A week later, if somebody asked you to play, you wouldn't have a fucking clue how to play it. So <laughs> it's all a load of learning process. So, yeah, I do have to go back to the old streaming services now and again to figure them out. And you said recently that Noel Gallagher loved Mr. Writer, um, saying yeah. that, like, that you played him some of the album, Mr. Writer turned his head instantly. So do you still ever play him any songs? Do you keep in touch with him at all? Yeah, I keep in touch with him all through text now. Again, last time I spoke to him, he was showing me pictures of his new studio. That was last last year. It looks great. I think he's in there now recording some new stuff. Um, we, we haven't played each other anything for years. I mean, in them days, we, you know, we'd all bounce around each other's studios. I go down to Henley on Thames where he was, uh, or Buckinghamshire, as the studio was then. Um, and I, I remember listening to some of their new stuff, and he came there. Most of the time, was ended up in the pub. So <laughs> uh, whether he remembers half the story, why I remember half the story is another matter. But you know, there's pieces of it that we can put together. But um, yeah, I mean, we, we put this record out through Ignition, which is Noel's. Um, management company as well so we distribute this record through them last time we worked together was on graffiti on the train so um i'm sure we bump into each other on the road in the summer at some point yeah i love that you said that you could never work out if you wanted to fight them or be like them basically that's like yeah. the admiration isn't it <laughs> yeah in the early 90s we'd watch one on the telly they'd wind you up but it kind of the same time you go but it's fucking all right though isn't it? i guess that was the thing for many people like great if you would see these other bands and that is the inspiration like kids today that are looking at musicians that are wanting to get into music it's interesting <clears> to think that people could be looking at you in the same way okay hopefully not wanting to fight you but yeah. inspiration yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I got on a bus the other day. I was taking my little one down to Hammersmith to the Lyric to watch Aladdin on Christmas week, you know. And uh, we got on a bus on the Fulham Palace Road 
because she had one of her little friends with her and everybody had masks on me. There was a kid sitting next to me who didn't have a mask on. I just kind of clocked him and he was he was fine. He was listening to his music. And uh, I had a mask on <clears throat> and he, because um, at that point, everybody was on about catching it for Christmas and all the rest mm. of it. And he got up and he walked about two steps just to go down the second half of the bus. And he turned around. And he said, you Callie Jones? And I said, yeah. I know he could see me with a fucking mask on. I said, yeah. And he goes, he said, I'm listening to you right now. Oh. And he was listening to um, You Gotta Go That's Come Back. And this kid must have been about 17. He had a skateboard under his arm. He goes, your music is such a big inspiration. When he got to the end of the bus and he jumped off the bus and he was calling his friend and skated off up the street. And I just thought, <laughs> fuck, you know, he wasn't born when I was written. <laughs> no. and that's made his day. He's probably told that same story to, to his friend. Yeah. So it's uh, it's nice when you see people who's into the stuff, you know, and we watched all those bands on the telly in the pub when all that music scene in the 90s was kicking off. It was an exciting time for music. So, Are there yeah. any new bands that you feel like are keeping the rock and roll flames alive? Is there anybody that you're liking at the moment? I, I mean, I listen to lots of stuff. I like the new Sam Fender stuff. I think he's a good lyricist. I mean, my kids are liking a lot of the Billie Eilish thing. I, I like what she does. I like what the video she makes as well. I think she's really good at doing that kind of visual stuff. Um, and my kids play. I mean, they're making playlists all the time, but I don't recognise half of what they're listening to. <laughs> so uh, I get education from them sometimes. I lie on Misty's bed and she'll play me something and I'm like, I no idea who that is, but, you know, keep going. I'll keep listening. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, that's kind of where it's at right now. It's keeping across it sometimes, isn't it? And knowing what else is out there. Because I know some musicians say that they don't want to listen to the new stuff because they don't want it to influence their music. And then on the other hand, you have some going, oh, no, actually, I want to hear something new. I want to learn something new and be inspired. So I guess it can be a yeah. little bit of both sometimes. It's very different. I think, you know, I've always kept my ear from a radio point of view. Um, but I see with my older kids, they don't really listen to the radio or, or watch the TV and stuff like that. So they get their music from different places. So where you used to think the new music was coming from, of course, there's loads of new music on the radio. Uh, but they're finding it from different sources. There's lots of guys who are gamers and YouTubers who make bands and stuff like that. And they listen to all their stuff as well. So it comes from all over the place now. It's not, you know, and they're not as tribal anymore. It's not like just listening to rock music or, you know, they listen to all sorts of stuff and everything is kind of, equally kind of uh enjoyed you know it wasn't like that when i was a kid you either liked that or you liked that you weren't allowed to like you know pop music and rock music you know that was a that wasn't allowed so i think it's quite good that they're pretty much open-minded when it comes to the arts these days and with the record is there any particular song on there that is a favorite for you i know that's probably a difficult question to answer but is there any on uh, there that you really love I, I really like um Leave the light on. I think there's a really, I mean, there's a live take and it's a really great sentiment. I think the song digs quite deep on the lyric content and the sentiment. I think seeing that look before is an old kind of soul kind of um, recorded live two o'clock in the morning kind of song. I think that's really captured something. Um, I think the big songs that have been released so far have been received very well. You know, uh, Forever is obviously doing really good and Do You Feel My Love and stuff. So it's a record that when we play it, uh, the rare amount of times we play it, which is in a rehearsal space when we're trying to work out which songs to do for the shows or whatever. I've forgotten how many different types of songs there are on there because they all span from very different places. So it's not like you can pick one which sums up the record, really, because it's all over the place. Um, so I guess my favourites will change over the years, I suppose. I love that there's the little clips of like the conversation at the start and the end. And those at the end of seeing that look before where it's saying yeah. like this, the studio chat sort of as you've got going back and forth sometimes. And yeah. Obviously, when you have like a mic that's on, you get some things that are picked up. that you're like, oh, we don't want that going out. But you just listen yeah. back to recordings and go, that's funny. We'll keep that. Yeah. I mean, me and Adam normally have quite a lot of banter when we're doing backing vocals or whatever. And that's him at the beginning of Hinges as well saying, send us home, Jamie. And then. Um, yeah, there's some really foul language on do not, uh, don't know what it, don't know what you got. Um, which when Al was mixing it, he sent me some lines in the chorus where it's on the record, but you can't really hear it. But there's some really <laughs> bad insults to one another because we were singing the wrong lyrics to each other. But yeah, there's some really dark words in there <laughs> if you listen <laughs> carefully. <laughs> I was listening to that now, like trying to isolate the vocals, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think when you have things like that, it makes you feel like that you're a part of it and that you're in the studio as well. And it sort of captures that energy and the fun of it, I guess. I think the album does do that. You know, it does feel like you're in the room with the band. And I, that was the main intention. 
uh, we wanted to make something, you know, it's quite an indulgent album. I would, I'd never put 15 songs on a record. I normally do, I'm a, I'm a 10 album kind of fan. Um, I just figured 25 years, two years being locked up, uh, be indulgent, you know, whatever. So it, I normally would have edited it quite hard, but we were just enjoying it really and just stuck it all together and just put it out as it was. So, and I think it does show a band at a point 25 years in, all like each other, all having a good time, and still putting out music that's relevant and in a good place, you know. Well, thank you very much for your time today and good luck with the record. Thanks so much. Thank you.